Hello, thanks for being here. It is a great honor for me tonight to introduce Professor Bona Dex Westcoat in person. Uh, so I'm going to uh, give you uh, a, a much abbreviated uh, account of uh, Bona Westcoat's uh, uh, many accomplishments, but I'm afraid that my introduction will be as long as their paper, if I mention all of them. So I will not. <laughs> so Bona Dakes Westcote is a classical archaeologist whose primary research centers on the intersection of architecture, ritual, and place in ancient Greek sacred contexts. She's the Samuel Kendler Dobbs Professor of Art History, as well as the interim director of the Michael Carlos Museum at Emory University, as well as the incoming director of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. A field archaeologist, art and architectural historian, uh, Professor Westcott has worked widely in the ancient Mediterranean. She has worked on the sanctuary of the great gods on Samothrace since 1977 and has served as director of excavation there since 2012. Westcott is interested in the ways in which ancient Greek architecture works an avid draftman, draftsman, she mines the archaeological record to reconstruct and explain ancient buildings. She is particularly drawn to innovative or non-canonical monuments that reshape our understanding of ancient, of ancient Greek architectural practice. In pursuing the meaning of buildings, Westcott has investigated the role and visibility of myth, imagery, and narrative on monuments such as the Temple of Athena at Assos and the Parthenon in Athens. Her work also engages the interaction of our architecture and environment as it shapes ancient Greek sacred experience. Bona Westcott takes a phenomenological approach to the physical, material, and spatial environment to explore the mysteria of the great gods on Samothrace, whose rites of initiation were kept secret. <laughs> to this end, she has developed a, the potential of three-dimensional digital modeling for documenting, analyzing, and communicating the complex spatial relationships that bind place, architecture, and ritual in this most yet elusive mystery sanctuary. Westcote has authored and edited several books, among which Poets and Heroes, Scenes from the Trojan War, Syracuse, the Fairest Greek City, Samothrace Volume 9, The Monuments of the Eastern Hill, Samothracian Connections, Essays in Honor of James McCready, Architecture of the Sacred, Space, Ritual, and Experience from Classical Greece to Byzantium in the Temple of Athena at Assos. She received her PhD and Master in Classical Art and Archaeology from Oxford University, an MA degree from the University of London's Institute of Archaeology, uh, and a BA in the History of Art from Smith College. Now, please join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Bona Westcott. I'm going to unmask because I think I'll be a little bit clearer to you all, but I do very much appreciate your wearing masks on this occasion. And I want to say how uh, grateful I am to Alessandro for inviting me here this evening. I had a wonderful time in Notre Dame some years ago at the invitation of Robin Rhodes to attend a Corinth uh, symposium, and uh, I'm very, very uh, grateful to be back. I'm only very sad that my good Vitruvian colleague, Thomas Gordon Smith, isn't with us. But I will have to say that there is not a time I don't think of him when I show his wonderfully evocative drawing of Callimachus uh, inventing the Corinthian capital uh, to my students. Now, archaeology is highly collaborative, and I'd like to, at the outset, in addition to thanking Alessandro for this invitation to come here, also thank my many team members. Uh, it, well, I, we just simply can't work uh, uh, solo in this field, and every single one of their contributions 
has been really uh, of greatest importance to the success of our project. I'd like to share with you today several areas of investigation across the sanctuary, but the particular emphasis will be on issues that center on the shaping and negotiating of sacred terrain. I'd also like in the process to emphasize the extraordinarily um, close relationship we have had with the architects that we've worked with at Samothrace. Uh, and we have uh, worked to preserve the creative process of hand drawing in the field, even as we move towards more digitally driven technologies. Uh, because all of you know that drawing is a form of seeing and a way towards understanding. And the art and the craft of archeology span really stems from acute observations combined with spatial imagination. Now, Samothrace uh, and the Sanctuary of the Great Gods are on a windswept island. Uh, it's worthy of our intense exploration because it's a physically remarkable place on Earth whose assets were recognized, manipulated, and aggrandized in the service of a potent mystery cult. The island's rise from obscurity to international fame was coincident with the transformation of the Mediterranean into the Hellenistic world. And by virtue of its location in northeastern Aegean, see here, it has uh, as focused as much towards the north of Thrace and the east of Anatolia as the south and west towards the heartland of Greece. So it's an interesting uh, place uh, within the geography of the Mediterranean, as, as well as an interesting place physically in itself. Now, the mystery cult of the great gods welcomed those who could make the journey and bore no blood guilt. Otherwise, they were, there was no exclusions, not on the basis of gender or ethnicity or, um, or um, social status, free or enslaved. All were welcomed, again, as I said, if you came and if you bore no blood guilt. As Alessandro mentioned, the rituals of initiation were secret, but the blessings were not. Protection at sea and the opportunity to become, as Diodora says, and I quote, both more pious and more just and better in every respect than they were before. Now these were famously valued and many found the journey well worth the risk. The island, the cult and the sanctuary thus really offer us a vital point of access, not only into the splendid sacred environment, uh, but also the diverse and changing social communities who found reason to value its promises uh, and state claims on its favor. Now, as you look at these images, I think you can see that the sanctuary of the great gods really has the unmistakable aura of sacred ground. For those of you who've been to Greece, uh, Delphi has the same capacity. It just sort of vibrates. There's something about that particular place on earth which feels special. And that's true of Samothrace as well. It's set facing the sea. It's in a cleft in the earth that was formed by uh, the, the convergence of three rushing torrents. It's at the base of a mile high mountain. And this place therefore really physically integrates the you know, um, you know, key forces of earth, sky and sea uh, that were played a fundamental role in the Mysteria. The, that's the name of the festival. And of course, uh, from which we take our word mystery. The rites of initiation were never divulged, no, so they, they kept their word. Uh, and uh, to improve our understanding, scholars have mined literary testimony of ancient authors. Uh, there are lists of initiates that have, been, have you know, inscribed their names. Uh, you know, I was initiated. Uh, and this provides us with extraordinary uh, um, opportunity to understand the, uh, the constituency of, of people who believed in the great gods. Um, we have... Uh, Innovative architecture, which is what I'll focus on tonight. Uh, there's also splendid dedications. You're all probably familiar with the great winged victory of Samothrace now in the Louvre. Uh, and then there's also, you know, this the humble detritus of cult, uh, animal bones, pot shirts, uh, uh, little bits and pieces of what people left behind. All of it's critical. Uh, and it built up over centuries, almost a thousand uh, years from the 7th century BCE to the 4th century uh, CE. Uh, but to this, we can also add another 
uh, aspect of, uh, of evidence, that one that we've become particularly interested in in the past several decades. Uh, under, it's been undervalued previously, but it's been lying in, high, in plain sight, you know, and that's the physical environment um, and the bodily actions and perceptions of visitors moving through that environment. And that is what we have really tended to, to privilege. Now, um, Samothrace has some of the most uh, unusual Greek buildings, in, uh, especially from the Hellenistic period. Uh, each one is uh, remarkable in its uh, um, engineering and also uh, uh, um, innovative architectural um, formations. Uh, perhaps one of the earliest of the Corinthian monumental exterior uh, colonnades is here at Samothrace. Uh, they're wonderful in many, many ways, and our architects presented them as you see here, painstakingly reconstructed and impeccably drawn. Now, we continue this trajectory because it captures the brilliance of Samothracian architecture, and the precision it affords is critical. And I learned this uh, um, dramatically this summer. Uh, so I want to share with you an, an early initiative uh, that I worked on and what we um, uh, confronted this particular summer when a very small uh, portion of our team was allowed back to work in the sanctuary of the great gods uh, with our Greek college. Uh, this uh, area is uh, on the, the Eastern Hill, the uh, entrance to the sanctuary. And I had worked off and on, as Alessandro said, it was the first time I'd ever been to Greece. I came to Samothrace. And then I worked in Turkey uh, and I was asked to, to come back in 1997. And I remember walking into the, the workroom and James McCready, who was the director said, well, there's one marble building left. And if you want it, you can have it. <laughs> okay, sounds good to me. Uh, uh, but it turned out to be a lot more than one marble building. It was a whole entrance complex that was uh, built up over uh, half a millennium of, of elaboration. It was the first place people landed when they came into the sanctuary. We're, we're talking about this area right here. So here, which eventually we came to think of looked like this. Uh, and uh, and we uh, uh, drew it in the way we knew how uh, at that time, um, uh, working uh, again, block by block uh, and measurement by measurement uh, and uh, uh, came up with reconstructions that we really, you know, we uh, looked at. And again, this is all uh, uh, hand drawing with ink um, on mylar. Uh, and so facade and axon, a cutaway, all trying to capture not just that one marble building, but also its um, placement, its, uh, um, it, uh, its relationship to other, other structures. Uh, so we we actually really succeeded on um, its again, precision reconstruction, but we're falling short on the uh, on the um, environmental front. Uh, but the precision remit was was really important because our Greek colleagues had decided that the monument that that one marble building that was left, uh, which happened to be uh, a dedication of Alexander the Great's successors, his. Uh, um, Half brother, who took the name Philip III, and his posthumous son Alexander IV, and they were together a very short time. And the one and only really major monument that they ever dedicated as a pair was here on Samothrace. Uh, and it's it's a pretty remarkable building. That's a subject of a whole nother lecture. Uh, but as I said, our Greek colleagues in reorganizing the museum uh, decided to create an anastylosis, and this was a really uh, big. Um, uh, undertaking, and we arrived uh, on the island when it, um, the anastylosis was um, uh, in, at this stage here. And I looked at the corner here, and I thought, "Oh, nuts!" Um, you know, it was just way out of line. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the 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 uh, restorer, whom you see here you know, I wondered, you know, who is this Sanos who's just showing up and telling me I put things in the wrong place. Uh, so we had to really um, do some negotiating and the way in which uh, we really succeeded, I said, well, 
don't worry about the drawings you have. Uh, just follow the ancient marks. And, yes, and uh, so we could all agree on uh, the, in the where we could see the weather mark of the triglyph, or where we could see the the um, in, in the, the impression of the capital. And uh, and then he got really excited, and he was willing to. Um, we didn't. We couldn't. We physically couldn't take down all of it, but we were able to shift something here and move something there. And and then you know uh, we got really into the. Uh, uh, um, a, uh, uh, a rhythm and we're able to come up with the, the final reconstruction, which is, is absolutely uh, um, to, uh, you know, following all the Greek ancient marks that are on the building using the ancient clamps and actually uh, um, reconstructing the building. But it relied on me being able to say, follow the marks and look at this drawing. Uh, so I, we really do believe in, um, uh, in, in the value of uh, um, our, our architectural precision. But as I, I mentioned, uh, we found ourselves uh, in a bind when we try to uh, convey the relationship of buildings to the sacred landscape. Because the, the act of moving through rugged terrain of the sanctuary was a vital part of initiation. We might not know what the secret rites were, but we can certainly know um, how people moved from one place to another, and what impact that had on the body, what impact that had on vision, what, you know, we can we really um, uh, create the experience around the experience of initiation. And that was harder within the landscape because as you can see, it's a really rugged uh, and um, uh, challenging terrain. Uh, and here you see just a, uh, some tourists who are thinking, you know, what do we do next? Where do we go? Uh, this is, they are on what was the sacred way, but it drops off uh, because that area has been scoured out. So it became uh, really critical for us to, again, uh, understand our brilliant architecture within its spatial environment. Um, and we began to really feel that the spaces between uh, buildings were as important as the buildings themselves. The hardscaping was what was actually manipulating people from one place to another. The, uh, and so, uh, um, again, this is not news to you, but it was uh, it was something that we had to work our way uh, into and un to understanding. Uh, and this was a nexus that was more difficult to represent two dimensionally. Um, and not least because of, as I said, the complex shifts in uh, our elevation and the, the really rugged terrain. So to, um, to understand it better, we uh, actually get, began our work with, uh, with 3D modeling. Uh, and uh, to, um, we, let me see, you can see maybe this uh, slowly coming into to vision. We found it a powerful forensic tool for interrogating the three-dimensional data and for visualizing the intermediary spaces within the sanctuary. And ultimately, um, uh, it emerged as a, a, a critical mediator for our understanding of the reciprocal relationships among architecture, passage, landscape, and, and human actors. Uh, there is, you know, of course, one issue that, that you know, we just have to a little bit get over, and that is that we're not Pixar. You know, we are still just a, a small a team of uh, of a university, uh, and yet I think that uh, that where we um, what we've been able to create uh, achieves our uh, our accomplishments of of creating an understanding of how uh, buildings were placed in the landscape and how we might uh, move among them. The work has proved especially valuable uh, in capturing uh, stark differences in elevation uh, and also uh, in being able to explore um, temporal shifts that uh, affect experience. We know that people entered the sanctuary of the great gods at night. That's different from uh, leaving in the day. Uh, the, the physical act of moving downhill is really different from the physical act of, of going uphill. And these were some of the things that uh, 3D modeling and animation allowed us to explore. And so I'd like to just share with you, um, you know, entering the sanctuary at night, um, uh, as, as you can see here, that it was in our aim to really explore what you could see. So we are on the ground at eye level, um, really pursue what the momentum of your body was be like. So we're, we're moving at kind of um, in real time. Uh, you can see you know, come down that steep ramp. Now we're in the theatrical circle. It's a sunken orchestra. Um, and then, you know, going around this uh, building that we spoke of 
Um, all of a sudden you see the rotunda. Here it looks like a, a, a colonnaded building, but as you go down towards the Central Valley where the uh, uh, aspects of initiation were held, it closes up. Um, and I think the designers knew this. We're about to get close to the hall of initiation. Then we have this small area in front. We look across a ravine uh, and, uh, uh, and then here we are uh, looking towards that hall of initiation. So this is the uh, experience that we wanted to explore with our um, our night uh, our, our night vision, so to speak. And then um, here here's the same experience during the day. Um, so you just you came in uh, uh, between these two buildings. Now you're going, you can really see how sequestered that sacred way is. It's tucked between buildings. You're, it's cut into the earth. You really never saw this ionic porch on the back of the Philip and Alexander building, uh, nor could you ever have seen its fancy coffered ceiling uh, when you're uh, on your way down. Uh, you can really also understand how you're kind of kicked out around the edge of this whole uh, um, uh, outcrop, uh, then brought back into it uh, for the theatrical circle. You see how complicated this passage is. Uh, and then you're turning to the propylon of Ptolemy uh, with his great Corinthian uh, columns. Remember when you came in, they were ionic. Uh, so it's done this transformation uh, um, between its two, its two sides. Uh, and we've always said that. We always said, oh, uh, the, the outer face of this building is ionic and the inner face of it is Corinthian. But when you 3D model it and you walk through it, it's like um, you, you understand more clearly how uh, important that uh, difference is. Uh, and how uh, the, the architects are really trying to tell you something about the difference between when you came in and when you went out. But they also can tell you the same things too. Both sides of that building are bear the identical inscription uh, dedicated by Ptolemy II, uh, one of the really most powerful of Hellenistic kings. He wants to claim the, the, the sanctuary going in and he wants to claim your, your um, changed status going out. Um, uh, so, uh, so these are things that, again, that we, you know, by watching uh, frequently and thinking about it and making the model, uh, we were able ourselves to think more about. Another part of the sanctuary that we've really privileged uh, uh, and um, in relation to our investigation of uh, the terrain and, and the natural part of the uh, experience uh, the last part of the, the island, which gives the sanctuary such a, a charged aura, is water. And uh, it, it's the shape of water, uh, the memory of water, uh, and the way in which water uh, uh, was uh, both a powerful force and a destructive force, and one that uh, could be controlled to be a very positive force. Uh, so uh, um, that, that has been uh, an investigation for about the past five years. I'm showing you here on your right uh, an aerial view of the sanctuary with the watersheds uh, highlighted. Uh, you can see that it's three torrents that are converging as they meet towards the sea. The blue arrow points to where the sanctuary is um, uh, in relationship to the island. Uh, and uh, here you see, uh, this is just showing you where the main sacred buildings are. Uh, we've looked at this view a couple of times, but it's really instructive to show you that we're working with an alluvial plain that's been really carved down. You can see, I think, quite powerfully, here's the eastern torrent, there's the central torrent, on the far side is the western one. And look, you can, you can barely see these uh, main sacred buildings in that valley. There was no walls around the uh, sanctuary at Samothrace, as there are amongst around many uh, Greek sanctuaries. Instead, they relied on these physical boundaries to create the um, secluded and sequestered uh, environment that were that was required of secret rites. Uh, they're the buildings that are uh, um, that held them the. the uh, rites of initiation are in this central valley, and they're, they're so they're not uh, exposed in the way, say, think about the Acropolis in Athens. Everything about that experience is Olympian. You go up, up, up. In Samothrace, it's a series of stage descents, down, 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 and then, of course, a return uh, from that uh, as a as a changed person. So 
the, uh, the chthonic experience is, is quite dramatic. Now, um, most of the time that we are in the sanctuary, uh, which is in the drier months of May, June, July, and August, the torrents there are either, you know, running, you know, kind of with a nice trickle, like you see on the left, uh, um, or they're dry completely. But the power of storms on this island is, um, uh, well, it's not uh, impossibly hard to describe. I can show you it. Uh, oh, I wish I could, I, th this should have sound to go with it, uh, but. Um, uh, <laughs> It's worth the sound. Hang on a second, because it's stunning. Right, let's give it a go. Oh, okay, go back one. Um, actually, he doesn't want to go back any. You might get caught in a storm. Okay, go back one. Okay, here we go. So th let me just say, this was a storm that came up in one hour in July of 2017. And that... Um, that was absolutely astonishing to us, but it was trivial compared to the storm that then took place in September uh, of 2017. There was a, another one in 2018 and one in also in April of this year uh, that just ripped through the sanctuary with extraordinary force and, uh, 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 and that, that force can be quite destructive uh, um, as we'll see. Uh, anyhow, um, what struck us was that from its inception, uh, the valley floor uh, near the banks of this stream were um, uh, the center of cult activity. Uh, we don't have time to really go over all the early pottery deposits, but they're found all along the edge here of this, uh, of this stream. Uh, and uh, it, um, it therefore was really important part of the cult, uh, this, this particular valley. Uh, and and this uh, uh, particular monument, we um, uh, wondered um, how you got across it uh, in antiquity. Uh, there uh, is a little bit of an evidence of a bridge in this area, but otherwise we we couldn't find much. And in over my many years of being there, sometimes this ravine is um, only a meter deep. Uh, filled with gravel uh, and detritus has come down the mountain and sometimes it's scoured to a depth of four meters. It's really the most um, extraordinary, the shifting channel I've ever looked at in my life actually. Um, it's, uh, um, uh, but, but as you can see the top of the screen, there's many monuments on the opposite side of this, uh, of this stream. So uh, controlling it and bridging it must have been an urgent concern. Uh, uh, and uh, um, we, we just also wanted to understand if its path was natural. Uh, is this, are they just simply buffering it a bit or, 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 or did they shape it to create the land that they needed for these major uh, architectural monuments, which you see here. Uh, so we uh, actually um, initiated a, a study of this, of this particular uh, uh, ravine and we treated it like a building. We treated it like a monument. Uh, it is, in fact, our biggest, it's our oldest, and it's our longest-lived monument in the sanctuary. It has a really important uh, Greek phase and, a really, and then another Roman one. I'm showing you on the left the Greek boulder wall uh, that exists up uh, towards the south as you enter into the sanctuary. Uh, these are megalithic boulders. It's about three meters deep here and about uh, two and a half to three meters wide. That channel uh, um, in other places uh, 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 was um, 
they've destroyed over time and replaced by a Roman uh, construction, which you see a large part of uh, here. Uh, and uh, it, um, just to give you a sense of scale, there's our photogrammetrist, uh, Vincent Bayet, uh, right here, um, you know, looking up and taking uh, photographs of, of this wall. We, we chose to use photogrammetry to record this, first of all, because we had very little time. Uh, secondly, uh, because the scale of the project was enormous and the changes in elevation, the shifts in the terrain uh, were, were such that uh, it, it really was um, uh, uh, the best route. Here, I think you can see just the channel as it's, as it's in its modern <coughs> configuration. It, it had to be controlled in the 1950s and then again in 2000. Um, uh, uh, because of storms, uh, as it had been in antiquity. Uh, here is just a bit of the photogrammetric process that we used, uh, um, uh, tar I mean, targets and cameras. This is now fairly uh, routine. When we did it, it was exciting and new to us in 2016 and 17. Uh, we then traced over, uh, we orthorectified and, and, uh, and stitched together and traced over our uh, ancient remains. And then the most important part uh, for us was in color coding the different phases. And we, we treated those phases, um, uh, you know, everything from uh, a, uh, um, a, a phase of construction, a phase of collapse, uh, uh, right through, as you can see, several phases from 1953, 54, 55. You could tell those were bad years. They, they suffered a lot. Um, and then our 2003-4, uh, now we're engaged in a large project with our big <laughs> colleagues uh, about how to best manage this um, in, uh, uh, in, in the oncoming years. But what I wanted to to show to you all was uh, um, uh, just what we discovered in the in the process of doing this, uh, and that was uh, um, we we had always known. I mean, this section of uh, that you see here, uh, which is also right there, um, just been always sitting there. Uh, and once we cleaned it up, we realized it. It was we thought maybe it's a vault of a the bridge, and that was exciting. But we we actually realized was it was the western side here that had just fallen flat into the center of, uh, of the channel. When, we're not sure, sometime after the sixth century CE. Uh, but uh, this dramatic collapse was actually almost identical to the collapse we saw happening um, in 2017, where, where parts of our the, the modern 1950s wall went over in the identical fashion. Uh, so it was uh, we realized that the storms in antiquity were really similar to the storms that we were experiencing. We uh, also um, wondered when, when we were working on this project, if we actually had the channel of the water in the right place. Uh, because as you can see, uh, if you look at the, the blue here, that's the, that follows the line of uh, the, the, the modern channel that was cut by uh, our 1950s colleagues, the, uh, Carl and Phyllis Lehmann. Uh, what we, in reading the, um, diaries a little more closely. Uh, I shouldn't say it was cut by them. It was that they, they, they built the walls for that. Uh, but they also used the channel for a Dockerville railway. And that sort of, in a railway, a railway needs to go straight. Uh, uh, and so this channel, which we had always thought was so remarkably northward um, directed, uh, um, and the more we thought about it, you know, thought, uh, particularly the work of Andrew Ward, uh, we thought, well, perhaps um, uh, it, it actually needs to be a little bit further to the west. So Andrew directed uh, excavations in 2019. And in fact, uh, we did find the ancient channel. This is this channel here. Uh, the tre sorry, trench here and here, we're looking at it. And basically, um, it, we have to shift the channel, one whole channel over, so to speak. And it follows a more gentle curve uh, running through the sanctuary. Uh, and uh, um, uh, and this, this uh, actually lines up with our, with our expectations. Uh, we, again, we saw the same kinds of collapse uh, here as we had uh, in the other 
image, <laughs> this, this whole section of wall here uh, was originally on this and just went right over. Um, we also found some really interesting uh, destruction debris on what was to be the inside of these retaining walls, the, the side that should have been up against the earth. The water jumped out of the track and scoured out behind the walls, leaving uh, large scale objects like this um, beautiful uh, ionic column base. Uh, and again, this was also something we witnessed in 2017. But I wanted to show it to you here because uh, for two reasons, two important reasons. One is, that uh, this actually matches another fragment, uh, two others that we have uh, from the area. Uh, and they don't belong to any building that we know so far. So that means that we've got an ionic monument out there that we should be on the lookout for. But the other thing that uh, um, intrigues me is how this uh, ended up getting kind of snagged on the back of this wall. Uh, and my feeling is that if we're ever to find the head of the winged victory, it's going to be like this. It's going to be caught up against the inside of, of one of these walls. So uh, that gives me some hope. Now, uh, I started this by suggesting that we really wanted to understand how people got from one side of this, uh, um, this uh, powerful water channel to the other. Uh, we know that it, they controlled it, uh, they, uh, they channeled it, uh, but how did they cross it? Uh, and uh, we, we looked carefully for any evidence of, of uh, archways. We have, for example, in uh, uh, the city walls nearby, a corbelled arches, uh, and that would work. Um, they uh, could be, you know, cover something between uh, two and three meters, uh, but we didn't find really any evidence of, 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 of corbelled vaulting. And we wondered about the weight of that on a uh, polygonal wall. Uh, uh, that would be for maybe the Greek period. Um, we do have, however, in Samothrace, great trees and wonderful um, uh, uh, opportunities to build wooden, simple wooden bridges uh, that could crisscross uh, the, the uh, the torrent in the places where they were needed. And so we're, we're currently looking at uh, this as the, the likely way that one uh, got across. And here's uh, an example of one uh, from the, the north side of the island, a little bit further to the east at Kerasia, uh, where you can see the same kind of boulder walls that are supporting this crossing of a, of a stream. And uh, uh, it is surely good enough for two goats uh, and probably a procession of uh, Samothracian initiates. But we also wondered where we wanted to cross. What we did discover in our, um, uh, you know, just over time working in the sanctuary, uh, and particularly with the uh, re-understanding of the main cult building, was that our plans for the sanctuary uh, that were all, you know, drawn in, in two dimensions uh, actually didn't take into account getting across. In fact, you couldn't get, uh, according to our plans, to the other, to any of the buildings uh, in this area of the sanctuary, because this building uh, blocks your access entirely from the eastern side. So you you have to cross over and cross back to, to get here. And that was one of the reasons why we were excavating in that area was to see what we might find of a bridge. Uh, but we did uh, think that we might rely on, uh, on some just sort of interactive gaming models to, to see uh, what would intuitively be in three dimensions a, an appropriate place of crossing. I have to press a different button to, let me see. Oh, here we are. Okay, so uh, <coughs> what we have here is a camera uh, and then a pink line above showing the line of the camera. And uh, one of our um, uh, digital specialists didn't, hasn't been in the sanctuary, was just told to get to the Huron. Um, by the best means possible. So he's he's kind of looking around. Can he cross here? No, nope, can't can't go right across there. Has to wait till he gets around. Now he now he has a shot. There's the Huron, as you can see, tucked away 
Um, and then you can walk to it, That's that works well. Uh, but now if he wants to go to the theater, how can he get there? Uh, he doesn't want to go all the way back where he came from. So he'd really like to cross over there. Um, uh, and then, you know, however, maybe he'd also like to go to the altar court. So he crosses back um, and eventually ends up uh, um, making his way to the theater. The, um, the idea here uh, is, you know, again, with working with easy wooden bridges to, is to, you know, where do you want to cross and could you build something there? Um, what also occurred to us uh, and this is just a hypothetical, uh, is that crossing was actually part of the experience. Uh, you were taken out of a space and then put back into a space. Uh, um, when you're crossing over this channel, you're in kind of a limbo. Uh, you're over a, a, kind of a bit of an abyss. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we began to think about this um, kind of sequential access as a, a critical part of uh, engaging the visitor. Uh, and initiate in the sanctuary. Now, the, uh, we focused on the Eastern Hill and the Central Valley, but as you can see, there's a very large part of the uh, um, sanctuary that's on the Western side of the ravine. And that also has been a key uh, part of our recent investigations. This is, we're gonna move to the Southern, the South and Western part of the sanctuary here to the famous uh, axis of uh, the theater, the Nikkei monument, and the stoa. Uh, so that's where I'm going to focus our attention for the next part of this lecture. Now, um, the monuments of the Eastern Hill and the Central Valley are really splendid marble monuments, uh, but those on the Western Hill are actually more uh, uh, made of more local materials. Uh, and uh, um, that have not received the kind of attention that our, our fancy marble monuments have. Although uh, they've been the subject of intensive excavation, especially the Stoa and the Nikkei monument, uh, they, um, they really haven't yet uh, been uh, well published. For the Stoa, it's simply a matter of scale. It was just so huge that it required a lot of time. For the Nikkei monument, there are genuine problems and I'll share some of them with you. Uh, for the theater, there's a real problem. Take a look. You can't see any theater. It's just a big grassy field. Uh, but it wasn't always just a big grassy slope. Um, uh, in 1923, a French Czech team excavated in the theater and they actually uncovered a fair amount. Uh, they made a nice drawing, but they failed to actually secure that drawing in space. Uh, and so we um, really didn't know where it was in relationship to the Nikkei monument above or the altar court below. That left a window for, uh, and, and then here's what it looked like in 1937. Uh, so uh, really just a, um, less than two decades later, the theater had virtually disappeared with the exception of one seat that remained in situ. So Carl Lehmann, uh, who was working on the altar court, which is where we're standing, uh, came up with his own design that, that, uh, for the theater that worked with how he understood this region. And you see that on, um, on the left. Uh, and then the uh, design you see on the, on the right was one that was a sketch made by uh, the French uh, um, uh, the team uh, after, you know, some you know, what, 30 years after they had excavated in the area. And so, uh, you know, Lehman felt uh, that he was had the, uh, justified in rejecting their plan in favor of his own. We felt uh, that uh, it was worth just investigating because when we began to survey in this area, we saw little nubs um, of uh, uh, architecture, you know, seats sticking up, foundations that, that were in arcs that we thought we might be able to trace. Uh, and so we, uh, we actually, um, uh, when we received a permit to excavate for a five-year permit to excavate in the sanctuary, we, um, we started with the theater and we spent one month working there and we had pretty good results given uh, 
what you see. Uh, I think you can begin, I think you can see, you can see how hard it was. It was really tough excavating, very slippery slope. Um, we had to actually um, nail down a ladder that people would climb up and down to, to get a purchase. Uh, but I think when you look at the image on your right, you can see those arcs of stones that are not theater seats themselves, but they're the foundations for theater seats. And then that channel you see at the top, that was the really um, the key discovery because that channel had been photographed by the French Czech team uh, because it had a pipe in it that they found very interesting. And we found the pipe. And that was uh, that allowed us to lock their plan into uh, on, uh, you know onto the ground uh, and know exactly where uh, where we were. So here you can see the pipe, and it even has the same cleanout drain that is visible in the 1923 photograph. So uh, this was a great this was uh, uh, this was happiness, so to speak. And here you see uh, the excavation uh, in its uh, final stages. It's all covered over now again, uh, but you can you can begin to see we have a theater and we were so proud and pleased when a tourist walked by and said, oh, look, a theater, uh, uh, because before they would they would just look. Uh, theory, um, so this, this is, uh, uh, is the French Czech plan uh, uh, laid over our trenches uh, and then uh, uh, with a proposed reconstruction. I won't go into all of the details of you know, our, um, our reconstruction, but the, uh, the one thing we do not know is the extent of the coil line or the caveat of the theater. Uh, we, we have for certain five uh, um, wedges, uh, whether that uh, was continued in a sixth uh, and whether they were uh, in seventh and whether they went all the way up uh, to the, the top or just on the in the lower section, we'll never know that that land is gone. Um, and so in our uh, in our quest to be clear about what we don't know as well as what we do when we offer reconstruction, we offer often multiple uh, um, ideas. Uh, we say which one we're going to work with uh, in the model, but we make clear that um, all three of these are options. Uh, and so here is the reconstructed model. And it was really important for us to secure the uh, plan of the theater, not only in, um, in, you know, in plan, but also in elevation, because it required us to rethink this entire area at, at two meters higher than um, we originally appreciated it. Uh, we had, there were staircases that were needed, um, uh, and uh, um, we had to actually rethink the building on the opposite side, which formed such a, a splendid backdrop. And we, in fact, had to uh, come to the determination that the south and west sides were at a different and higher elevation than the east and north sides. And that was really... Um, you know, that's not the way Greeks usually design. You have a nice, beautiful foundation and a crepus and the building is all on one level, but there's a very important exception. Uh, uh, and that's the Erechtheion in Athens, which also is operating at multiple levels. Uh, so, um, and we, we have actually the architecture to, uh, to, to feel secure in this reconstruction. So, here you might just take a look at this is what the slope looked like and then here uh, our uh, reconstruction kind of fade in over um, it with the model. Now, theaters are often in close proximity to stoas, uh, and that is the case at Samothrace. In fact, the theater is probably the best point of access and maybe the, have been the only point of access for this 104 meter long stoa that you see at the top of your um, of the image. Now, uh, as I said, the stoa has attracted less attention than our magnificent marble monuments. Um, and yet it really offers uh, a lot 
uh, um, I mean, and when I say a lot, I mean, it, there's a lot. There's 2,100 blocks uh, uh, associated with the building, and we had to separate them out uh, because there's more than one building up there. 1,700 belong to the STOA. Um, it took us, you know, we have uh, over a thousand terra fragments of the terra cloud roof. We have over 500 metal fasteners. It's a thousand lots of plaster that belong to its interior. So this building has kept us um, really busy in the past couple of years. Uh, but uh, again, proud to say our team has really done an excellent job. The, uh, uh, some things caught us by surprise, uh, uh, such as uh, when we were measuring the, um, the going back up one, uh, here, making the, the plan of the, of the foundations in our survey, uh, we um, came across the curious factor that the whole building uh, seemed to be on you know, a slope. We thought, okay, well, the land is subsided. No, but it was too perfect a slope. It was, uh, uh, um, it, it really operated by the, the centimeter every meter. And this is 104 meters long. So that's a drop of a meter uh, in elevation. Uh, which was really, um, we just, we kept, we kept remeasuring, we kept thinking, we, we've gotten this wrong. Uh, but it was pretty, um, it was pretty definite. Uh, so we thought, okay, we need to look at the architecture and actually see if it's telling us the same thing. And we did happen to have uh, um, a really important column to it too, actually, really important column drums uh, that belong to the corners. And, uh, and so we measured every single flute. And in fact, they were cut on uh, a diagonal, which did mean that they were responding to a slope. But we also, so we said, okay, we have evidence in the, um, in the, at the ground, but it also has to be corrected uh, in the entablature. And we had the corner piece of the entablature. And so uh, we ran up with a, an L square and sure enough, it too was cut at the angle that one would expect um, of a building that needed to be corrected for a, um, uh, you know, a, a slope. A slope. Uh, so um, here just to, to show you a, a Manolis Carez's uh, exaggerated uh, um, image of a column. This is basically what we were uh, what we were seeing, uh, but not for inward inclination. This was just for heading, um, for sort of correcting for a downward slope. Uh, this is the extent of it. It's pretty, as I said, it's pretty dramatic. Um, uh, and uh, uh, but you know, in on paper, uh, when uh, when one is on the model, or uh, 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 it, it, it's not quite so um, apparent. But that was uh, something which we, we spent a lot of time deciding we, we were going to live with. Um, another thing that we, um, uh, we had some fun with uh, was uh, the Geisen course. The front of the building is Doric, uh, the internal colonnade is, is Ionic, and the back of the building faces um, just uh, into the western side of the, of the uh, uh, of the island, it, it doesn't. There's nothing behind it uh, uh, formally. So uh, the Samothracians didn't waste their time carving a very fancy uh, cornice for this area of the building. Instead, they relied on more of an Ionic style. Here is a, um, a section through the Doric cornice with its mutuals and gutti, uh, and then this is the more simple Ionic style cornice that was uh, assigned to the back of the building. The the question we had was how do these two go together? Uh, and so, uh, um, unfortunately, we were able to find some evidence that helped us out. Uh, there uh, were, was another French team that followed uh, Jean Poiseau, who was the discoverer of the victory. He uh, was there in 1863, and the French government sent a team of architects, Deville and Cocard, back to the island in 1867. And they were a fairly remarkable pair. They did. Uh, some nice plans of the sanctuary. They uh, um, commented on the winged victory, which they found to be a mediocre work of late date. But they said, we've got this beautiful angle du fronton. Um, and they even put it on their plan and they numbered it. Uh, and we go, well, that's really interesting. They called it out in the text. Uh, but then 
so we were um, actually going through the inventory of the Louvre and there was a block that was described as part of a monument and said to be found near the Stoa. And I thought, well, I wonder if that's the Angle du Fontaine. And, um, and then I thought, you know, this looks like it belongs to the Stoa, not some other monument. Uh, and so sure enough, we, we um, worked with our French colleagues with whom we're very close to uh, take a look at this block, which had been moved from Paris at this point to the storage of the Louvre Lens Museum where they have their storage. Now, why the, um, why the French architects felt this particular piece of all others uh, deserved to be transported to Paris is um, somewhat beyond us. Take, you, you see what it looks like there on the right. It, it's the kind of mangled up bit of, uh, of, uh, of entablature, but, but it turned out to be really important to us uh, because we were able to um, measure it and uh, photograph it and close to Dale, here's Sam Holzman of our team uh, um, uh, doing his magic. Uh, and this is his drawing where he, he shows you the reconstructed block here pulled out, uh, here, its actual state, its reconstruction, and then the, 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 matter, the manner of their joining which turns out they were simply just put right next to each other. And uh, um, then the architects just moved on. So that was, uh, but, but it was kind of fun to, to pursue this particular issue. Uh, now, in the interest of time, I may actually skip over our emphasis on, on materiality, but I do show you our, our wonderful geologist, Bill Size, who with a team of, uh, our, of our students, actually um, determined the um, type of every block, the stone type of every block used in the sanctuary, every different kind of limestone, every um, uh, different kind of, uh, of, um, uh, of igneous uh, rock. And it, it really actually has helped us to uh, create a building history. Uh, here you see all those, um, we, we color coded every block according to um, their, uh, their material. And you begin to see some clear histories emerging. I said I wouldn't talk about it, but I'm, I can't resist, sorry. Um, uh, in the, our two oldest buildings uh, over there on the left are of real mixed materials. Uh, actually, a lot of blocks are reused. So they're telling us these buildings both belong to the fourth century, but they're telling us that there was things on in the sanctuary that were earlier. That's exciting. Then we have this group here, all made of the same material from the same quarry quite near the sanctuary, a kind of uh, buggy pebbly limestone is what he called it. Uh, and these actually, you know, the, the top three here on Rotunda and Propylon all seem to be Ptolemaic dedications. The Naorian, which held a ship um, perhaps a, a, a little later. Uh, but there we've, got, there we've got our third century, first half of the third century buildings. Uh, then we move into the Stoa, all its own material, totally different quarry. Uh, so this is being paid for differently than our um, you know, fancy marble buildings that have uh, the other kind of limestone foundation. Uh, and, and then uh, on your lower right, the Nike monument, uh, which is made of a different material still. And you'll know, uh, I just want to uh, that that particular purple, which you see there, isn't found in any of the other buildings. And that, that will become important in our next um, uh, monument. And I, I, I beg your forgiveness that we're going a little bit over time, but I turn to the final topic. Um, we, can, we can skip the quarries here, we can do that, uh, which is the, the winged victory. Uh, she was at the top of the sanctuary uh, in the, um, above the theater. We're standing where she originally stood, so she had a vantage across uh, the sanctuary and out towards the Thracian streets in uh, honor of the 150th anniversary of her discovery uh, in uh, 2013. We joined forces with the Louvre. They cleaned her. They re-restored uh, the um, prow on which she, she alights. And we were to um, understand better the precinct in which she stood. That wasn't so easy. Uh, and this is, and uh, it's, um, it's why that uh, even though the most famous monument of this sanctuary was the winged victory, it has been so difficult for every single uh, excavator to actually um, publish something about 
the circumstances of where she stood, uh, with the exception of Carl Lehmann's uh, suggestion that originally uh, she was part of a fountain. Now, this is a, a brilliant idea, uh, but un un unfortunately, it, it, um, it doesn't work. There's a number of reasons why, why we can't rely on this wonderfully evocative reconstruction. Uh, so uh, um, we, we, we took, tried to tease out of this sanctuary and this area uh, of the sanctuary, sorry, uh, what we could. Uh, and we started with materials. Uh, this this um, purple colored stone is a, um, a uh, uh, what, our, what Bill has called a um, uh, uh, pebbly calcareous sandstone. Uh, and as I said, it's not found in any other monument in the sanctuary and it and you know some of the recent monuments are really well preserved uh their foundations are good the blocks they don't stand but the blocks are all around them but look at how stripped out this is it's you know we've got a little bit of the back at the back of the second stair and then drops down to the first and then we've got just the lowest course of foundation here in front this is really unusual most samothracian monuments are well preserved this one is not most Samothracian monuments are made of really good material. This one is not. Uh, so that perplexed us. Um, uh, and let's see if we can, okay, we crossed her off the list. Uh, and then working with the material, here it is. Um, what we discovered was that there was another building that was made of this material. It just happened to be Byzantine. Uh, and in fact, uh, and, and about 100 meters to the north of, uh, of, the, um, of the Nike monument, just north of the Stoa. Uh, so this is, where the, this is where the Nike monument went, uh, uh, was into this Byzantine building. Uh, it, the fragments were broken up, as you can see here, with team member uh, Jess Pega pointing out to, uh, um, to students at the time. Uh, and uh, uh, the other thing, in addition to it being kind of destroyed, was the fact that um, you know, we just we didn't find we found lots of blocks but we didn't find anything that told us about the order of the building we didn't find a, a, a column fragment we didn't we found no molded pieces so we really couldn't know if this was just from the the crepice the foundations and the steps uh, or if it represented some part of the upper part of the building uh, we have been uh, you know, working this problem, and, and uh, we're, we're getting close at being able to perhaps make a decision about whether the victory stood in an open or a roofed environment. Uh, but right now, we're offering both as suggestions. Um, it's interesting that she's pretty visible in either circumstance. Um, uh, and, uh, and so we're, we're, we're trying to get used to both ideas uh, as, we, um, as we evaluate the evidence. So we, we're, we're not heartbroken when one or another becomes um, more likely. Now, um, there was only one way in which we've made a, a, a positive intervention on the statue itself, uh, and uh, that's our most recent work. So I just wanted to show you uh, um, very, very briefly some of it. This is the new uh, uh, setting of the statue in the Louvre, uh, where she's placed further back uh, against the wall. She's still in the Daru staircase. She's raised up from the ground, as you can see here, um, and she rests directly on the prow. Uh, she doesn't have that horrible um, uh, blo intermediary block uh, that um, uh, she was placed on uh, in the 1930s. But you will notice that the, 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 the fighting part of this uh, war prow, uh, the ram, is completely missing. It was part of a block that was cantilevered three meters from here all the way up, like here. And it's, it's not a surprise that that part snapped off. But in both, um, and there's where it should be, uh, in both the Louvre and in Samothrace, we have bits and pieces of it. Uh, and so we 3D modeled these bits and pieces and we began to put them back together. And we, we noticed that some from Samothrace actually joined the ones uh, at the Louvre. Uh, and we were able to, this is the underside of that, um, uh, of that uh, prow uh, with the keel moving into the ram. Uh, and so we actually were able to fit this directly on the block that survives and come up with, 
with this reconstruction, which I think is pretty close to what the original um, uh, monument uh, looked like, because we have uh, other parts of the um, the upper um, the upper ram and the acrostolian uh, that's in front. So that's our that's our most uh, recent contributions to the statue. <laughs> uh, so um, you know it is now in the Louvre, but its placement uh, uh, above the theater, whether covered or open, and you stand in that place here. Uh, it was brilliant. Uh, it served as a visual pivot, uh, connecting the stoa to the theater in the heart of the sanctuary. It looked out uh, towards the Thracian Straits, straight up that central channel, so uh, emphasizing that water connection. So in this evening, we really traced the journey of visitors uh, through an extraordinary terrain. Uh, they entered the Temenos at night, they descended into sequestered valley, they underwent an initiate initiation rites that were secreted in great covered halls. They emerged to celebrate with theater uh, performances and feasting on the slopes of the Western Hill, uh, where they might appreciate the scope of their endeavor and reflect on their new prospects that lay before them. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank you, uh, Bona, for this uh, uh, incredible journey through such a fascinating uh, sanctuary as the great gods in the summer phrase. Uh, and I personally found that the, you know, the uh, analyzing or reconstructing the experience of the initiates or non, not yet initiates or uh, about to be initiated <laughs> to the mysteries was so, it was a new, a new way of looking at you know, old stones, and many of us in, in this room have looked at many stones, but rarely, and I'm talking uh, about myself, rarely have I uh, uh, think or uh, imagined the, uh, the the whole experience of, uh, of the building, how the building was used, or the, the whole ensemble of buildings might have been used by ancient users. So, uh, Professor Westcote will uh, now take some questions. Robin. Yeah, thank you. That was really lush on the visual spirit. Oh, what is this? It was just so rich visually. And I am uh, I want to reiterate something that Alessandro was talking about, which is just that well, it's not very common that people really do try to reconstruct the experience based upon the architecture itself. But one of the things I found just wonderful about this is that it's not just based on the architecture, it's also based on your experience of it through your reconstructions, your 3D reconstructions, through your photographs, and through your own walking through it. And I love the fact that you just set your guide free with his camera and ask him to follow his, his, you know, his intuition. So I would love to hear a lecture sometime where you just use all of the evidence you have, visual and, and, and uh, literary testimony, as a way of you know, trying, trying to reconstruct that whole experience. But what I found myself thinking about, and one of the things I, I thought about in other contexts is that with, with processional architecture or with religion, religious procession, people rarely think about the, the leaving. <laughs> And I, and, and I love that you started out talking about the leaving, about the goal, because that is equally important. It's just that we don't normally consider it. And so I wonder if you ha have, I mean, I'm sure you have, but if you could talk, just, just give me a little hint of what you feel the uh, sum of the experience of leaving was intended to be on the basis. I mean, I look at the, the Corinthian capitals and I start, my mind starts going crazy. So um, I just wonder if you could talk about that. Well, mine did too. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, Robin Rose is a real expert in the notion of processional architecture. So I'm happy to talk with him about this. Uh, the, um, you know, what got me focused on that was it was an Olympic year. 
Uh, and I was watching the opening and then I was watching the closing. I thought, you know, wow, it really is important to close experiences. And then I was also um, with a, a, a at the National Humanities Center with a scholar of um, uh, an Indian scholar who focused on her work on pilgrimage. Uh, uh, and uh, she, you know, her book um, uh, began, you know, that the that a successful pilgrimage is when you get home. And both of those things made me realize how important closure was. But there, uh, and I, I won't keep all of you. I can I can talk to Robin at greater length. But the his, his issue with the Corinthian is really important um, because we mentioned that this is a chthonic experience. You're going down into the earth. Things happen to you. They're scary. They're dark. You're blindfolded. Um, uh, you know, uh, Harmonia is lost. They have to find her. She's found. She, uh, everyone rejoices. Uh, there's a lot of emotion that goes on. Uh, there's a lot of disorientation. And at the end, remember, you're told the gods will protect you uh, um, in times of peril, especially at sea. And you are also a different, better person. So as you're then, so with all that in your mind, you then start to trudge out of the sanctuary. And it's a it's a climb, um, you know, out of the earth. Uh, and you make it to that theatrical circle and you look up and there are those Corinthian columns uh, that, uh, you know, decorated with acanthus leaves, which are a regenerative plant. Um, and as, uh, um, uh, you know, we're told, uh, we grew up around the grave of a Corinthian maiden uh, uh, and uh, are associated with funerary monuments. So is this some kind of regeneration of the, the, of the initiates themselves? So they're kind of being welcomed into their new life. I, um, purely hypothetical, but kind of intriguing. Uh, and an explanation of why you would go to the trouble of making a building of two, diff two different orders. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for your lecture. You didn't talk <clears throat> too much about the rotunda. Do you, can you tell us a little bit about the function of the rotunda because it's quite a remarkable building the way you reconstructed it. I, I I so wish I could tell you about the function of the rotunda. Um, uh, you know we have we have some amazing buildings in the sanctuary. Uh, we can date them. We can reconstruct them. We even know who who paid for them, and we don't know how half of them functioned. Uh, and the rotunda is one of these problematic buildings. It. Um, uh, possible suggestions that have been made is that it enshrined an altar, uh, which uh, Arsinoe, its, its patron, uh, you know, she she fled to Samothrace uh, for, for sanctuary, uh, and uh, Georges Rue proposes this is the this is the place she came, and it's being marked um, with this extraordinary building. Uh, 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 Walter Berger suggested, oh, maybe Thronosis happens in here. That's the right when people were blindfolded and. And then they were danced around and symbols were banged and they were um, uh, brought to an agitated state. Uh, and then Kevin Clinton says, oh, you know, maybe for maybe it's for the dining of the pharaoh. That's that's how that's how wildly disparate um, suggestions have been. One thing really is one thing I, I, I don't know how it functioned um, and I wish I did. But I um, one thing I think that is really important is that it overlays one of the really earliest um, uh, ritual deposits, it and the Hall of Choral Dancers. So uh, we, we didn't talk a lot about the Hall of Choral Dancers here, and here's the rotunda, but both of them are on top of the earliest um, uh, uh, evidence of cult. Uh, and that 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 means it, I, to me that that place has to also be have a cultic uh, function. Uh, so I, I'm really pressing my team members who who, who are uh, especially interested in the religion like Kevin Clinton, that he can't leave out the rotunda as a sacred building. But that's the best I can do at the moment. Hello, thank you so much. It was a great presentation. Um, very fascinating. I was wondering, I think you, you touched upon this idea, which I think is kind of intrinsic with the classical and the cult status, which is a hidden in plain sight. And I was wondering if you could um, 
go maybe touch upon your, your idea of that um, crossing of the channels as a part of the initiation or some kind of uh, ritual effect? You know, um, uh, a, a fantastic question. Uh, and one, one of the things that we've, um, we have to catch ourselves with a little bit is that, um, you know, we, uh, it, it, we, 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 um, we don't know what happened uh, really in initiation. We have some ideas and we suspect that the initiation things that did happen happened indoors. They happened either in the Hall of Coral Dancers or in the Huron and the altar uh, in the and in the rotunda. Um, so that uh, and this is how they could remain secret because the sanctuary is really open. As you can see, anybody you can it's, it's not easy to get in the, the slopes, but you can. Uh, and so the way in which they could protect their privacy was by going indoors. At Eleusis, the other great mystery sanctuary, there's massive walls and they had guards. Uh, not so at Samothrace. Uh, so the things that happen outdoors that we've been um, investigating are um, a kind of the uh, the interstitial fabric. This is you know the the connect the connective to the um, to the the really important rituals, uh, and uh, the um, uh, this crossing back and forth over this stream uh, is um, is is. Uh, uh, you know, just an idea that we're we're, we're toying with the the major uh, uh, ritual buildings and the earliest cult uh, uh, deposits are all on the eastern side. So we can't say that going back and forth was part of the cult from the beginning. Uh, uh, now we might find great, wonderful deposits on the western side, but we don't have them now. Uh, uh, but pretty, you know, pretty soon after they really got going in the fourth century, they expanded to the western side. Uh, and this building here in the center, the Hall of Coral Dancers, totally blocks off the south end of the sanctuary, um, and it's it's the earliest of the big marble buildings. Uh, so they so uh, as soon as they monumentalized, they actually had to figure out how to go back and forth. So I, I think. Um, uh, that one of the things we're discovering is that the the sacred experience was crafted uh, and it was and was developed and was thought about uh, by the Samothracians uh, as um, uh, as something that they they you know uh, could build upon uh, and uh, and maybe something started out being just a necessity. Uh, we have to make this building this wide uh, to fill the whole sanctuary. Therefore, you're going to have to go out and come back again in to get to the Huron. Uh, but it becomes in itself, you know, uh, uh, a really, you know, um, an opportunity, uh, a new idea that they uh, that then became part of uh, the the experience. Um, and uh, uh, so we we have uh, you know some team members who say you know no you, you know you're making too much of it uh, and then others who see it as the core uh, um, uh, you know the, the constituent aspect of uh, of the experience. Um, I happen to really think it's interesting. Uh, I don't know why you know they had every capacity to do whatever they really wanted in this space. They're amazing engineers. Uh, and uh, and they moved the eastern torrent. So if they had wanted to move the central one, they could have done so. Uh, uh, that, and that's why I think that they um, uh, these are, uh, the way in which they've crafted this experience is, is quite intentional. Hi, thank you. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I have a few questions I'd like to ask you about uh, too. Uh, one of them is how has the, the findings that you've made, especially in particular the water channel, affected your understanding of the orientation of the building and how, you know, if you think of the phasing of the science with respect to the orientation of particular buildings and the spaces that they end up creating, um, has that led to a reinterpretation of the functionality of the different spaces uh, attached to these buildings? I think particularly the, the central building, obviously, its orientation is very interesting with respect to the channel. But what are your thoughts about that? But this is a, a, a great question and one that's actually really um, perplexed us. Uh, there's a number of buildings that are oriented northwest. Um, and you can see that the whole of Coral Dancers here, 
uh, the Philip and Alexander building um, uh, uh, and uh, you know, a part of the, the Huron, they're, they're all, it's north, uh, north, northwest. Uh, and uh, we don't, we don't know why, you know, we, we, there's, um, uh, we were, we thought, oh, maybe it's oriented on Mount Pangaion. We, we thought, you know, maybe there's some astral significance we're not, you know, we're, we're not paying attention to. It certainly has nothing to do with the rising of the sun that, that we know for certain. Um, but uh, uh, anyhow, that's, so that's actually um, you know, uh, kind of intrigued us, but we, we haven't gotten very far. Uh, what is interesting about the um, the, uh, the, the, the central channel and, and even the eastern channel is that they're, they're knitted into the architecture, uh, which, uh, and that we hadn't paid attention to before, uh, that, they, that the complex of the theater and the, and the altar court is pulled together across the channel. Uh, and I didn't dwell on it, but the, um, the propylon of Ptolemy here, they actually, this is where they've redirected this channel uh, to actually run under the building and it becomes, the channel becomes, and the water crossing and passage from sacred, from profane to sacred space becomes part of the building. Uh, and then it, and then the Propylon of Ptolemy is facing into the dedication of Philip and Alexander. And uh, anyhow, so it's, it's there, it's all part of a, um, uh, a architectural elaboration of a natural feature uh, that, uh, um, uh, I don't know of elsewhere. Uh, there, you know, I'd be really intrigued to talk to others about whether the same um, uh, incorporation is, is seen happening in other sacred contexts. Really interesting. Uh, sorry, just brief though. Um, just say something about um, how the sanctuary changed under, under Roman rule and uh, what kind of evidence do you have for the, for the site um, in the Roman period? Um, I. I, I, you know, the, the risk of of, uh, um, of keeping you here a little longer. It is worth worth noting uh, that the last Macedonian king, Perseus, uh, was actually captured in the sanctuary of the great gods, uh, uh, and uh, um, by um, Gnaeus Octavius, who was an admiral under Aemilius uh, uh, Paulus. Uh, so the, the last stand of the Macedonian kings uh, happened right here. Um, and uh, and Carl Lehmann even felt that that where Percy's hid was right between these two buildings here. <laughs> uh, he he was a very colorful and, and uh, um, an explicit scholar. Uh, our story in the Roman period is that patronage stopped. Uh, all of those fancy buildings are uh, are the dedications of Hellenistic kings, and they're they're no more. Uh, so what we find in the Roman period is resilience. Uh, there, you know, we, uh, there's an earthquake that knocks down the roof of the rotunda, it's rebuilt. Uh, another one knocks out the um, theatrical circle uh, and de dedication of Philip and Alexander, and they don't rebuild. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, the channel, the central channel, uh, is, is massively rebuilt. So they are still in operation. Uh, and we know they're incredibly popular to the Romans for, for a couple of, of really important reasons. The member of the Samothracian uh, myth, uh, mythical family, Dardanus, uh, is the founder of Troy. Uh, the uh, Penates, the Roman Penates, Aeneas, um, takes to Rome are the great gods. So uh, for both um, uh, in terms of blood connections and religious connections, the Romans thought of themselves, thought of their ancestors as being Samothracians. So we were a tourist place uh, uh, for um, uh, for Romans, uh, uh, as you know, uh, and and many of the initiates uh, uh, signed their names in Latin. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. I had a question about the origin of the sanctuary. I'm thinking about uh, other places like Eleusis, mm -hmm. which of course has a Mycenaean foundation, Megaron <coughs> e, uh, beneath the Telesterion and so on. And I was struck by the similarity of the uh, picture you showed of the, of, of, the, of the megalithic wall looked very cyclopean. And I, of course, want, wanted to ask if 
there is any evidence of a prehistoric uh, precursor to the sanctuary in, in the excavations that might have, might have emerged? Uh, not here. Um, it was Carl Lehmann's um, uh, uh, mantra every year is this year we'll find the Palace of Dardanos. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, um, but, but really the sanctuary's earliest um, uh, evidence is, is some G23 ware, which belongs to the seventh century uh, on pottery, seventh century BC. There, Samothrace has a really rich prehistoric um, uh, occupation, but it, it doesn't happen to be mostly on the north side. It's more on the southeastern side. Uh, and then we have an Iron Age that, that operates around 500 meters um, and rings the island. And it, it's only kind of late in the day that this particular uh, spot uh, became a, um, an important part. However, I would like to say that just um, over behind the propylon of Ptolemy here <laughs> is the unexcavated ancient city. Uh, and uh, and we, we, there's, there's traces and hints of very interesting things to come. And it's, it's possible that, um, uh, that that will show us some, something different. I don't think it'll be Bronze Age, but I, I think it'll be wonderful. Uh -huh. Well, thank, thank you very much. And before you go, this is for the students, but also for faculty possibly. So the excavation team on Samothrace welcomes students of architecture. Every year, the team is enriched by the contributions of students just like you, students of architecture from all over the country who uh, have a wonderful time um, observing, drawing, and graphically reconstructing the ancient sacred buildings of the sanctuary. So we uh, had a, an interesting conversation, uh, Bona and I, and, and uh, uh, Krupa, Professor Kruse, uh, about the possibility of, for example, um, opening up the possible, uh, the, the, you know, the, this uh, fantastic uh, opportunity especially to students who are already enrolled because you know transportation is is you know uh, especially in these times of pandemic has proven to be uh, problematic so uh, our third year students right after they finish uh, our uh, year in rome might consider among uh, other opportunities that that of uh, spending one more month or so we use it there about six weeks, so yeah, but oh. you know people come and go too. Yeah. See so about six weeks uh, on Samothrace. It's not too far. Uh, Rome is about one hour from Athens to fly, and then how long does it take to Samothrace? Well, uh, <laughs> that's a, it's not a, too far. It, no, no, but uh, uh, but it's an adventure. No. <laughs> so if you are interested, especially if you're in your second year, please let us know, and we'll. Uh, explore this option with you. So again, uh, Bona, this has been a wonderful journey through the sanctuary. Thank you so much. And thanks for being here in person. And thank you for being here. Is this your building? Oh, sorry. 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 Oh, sor